So hi, welcome. Um, this talk is about how PostgreSQL can help you enforce best practices. Um, and we'll see what that means in a moment. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jimmy. I live in Edinburgh in the UK and I work as a senior solutions architect for EDB, who have kindly sponsored my travel here. Uh, EDB are also kind enough to pay me for working on Postgres, which is great, uh, because the only thing that EDB does is Postgres. So uh, my background is in software architecture. I've been using open source uh, and contributing to open source for close to 25, more than 25 years. Postgres specifically, I've been using exclusively as a database for more than 15 years. I'm a member of Postgres Europe. Uh, shameless plug, uh, there's a book coming out that I'm a co-author of, the Postgres 16 demonstration cookbook. Uh, you can find me on Mastodon, and this is also going up on YouTube, so I'm going to be So what is this talk? Right. So, IT systems uh, can have things in common, and uh, which means that what's what's good practice for one system uh, will also be very good practice for another system. Uh, specifically, in this talk, we we'll look at the best practices for uh, Postgres and how they apply to other. IT systems in general. So don't expect this talk to be all inclusive. It won't be everything that you can do right or wrong in uh, an IT system. And it will be preachy. It will be slightly opinionated uh, for a reason. Because these best practices uh, should be followed more. So the things we will uh, look at is using the proper data types, uh, locking in the database, how we can deal with high concurrency and a high transaction rate, uh, home brewing distributed systems for distributed transactions, and why not to do it, uh, tracking the resource usage for your system, uh, security related best practices, high availability related best practices, and uh, some other stuff. So let's begin with uh, using the proper data types. So about data types and how to use them as database keys. First of all, you should make sure that you're using the correct data type for every kind of data that you're storing. So, for instance, you shouldn't store a date time as text because then you can't do anything with it. You can't add or subtract. You can't sort it. Right? So all these operations are impossible. Uh, it's also a waste of space because you're using more space to store a string than uh, an actual daytime value. And as we said, you cannot index it, you cannot perform calculations. So it's good to be aware of the data type that you the storage requirements for the data type that you're actually using. And it's a good idea to not use more storage than you actually need. So uh, instead of if you have a ticket management system, instead of storing open or closed for the status of the tickets, you can have it as open uh, as a Boolean true-false. Uh, and the reason why you want to store as little data as possible is because it adds up. For example, this is near where I live. It's the bridge, the fourth bridge. Right? It's a really famous bridge. Uh, that was built uh, in Victorian times. 
you, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's bright red. So they paint, they paint it regularly. It's being painted. Um, the paint that they use is 240,000 liters of paint. Right? So 240,000 liters of paint is maybe 350, 400 tons of weight. So it adds up, even though uh, there's only a tiny amount of paint on the surface of the bridge. Across the whole bridge, there is like 400 tons of paint, which is extra weight that the engineer had to take into account for the stability of the bridge. So it all adds up; it all counts. So let's see that the data pipe sizes that you're likely to run into uh, if you use Postgres. First of all, how many of you actually use Postgres? And, that's, and how many of you identify as developers? Nice. Okay. So this is going to be useful for both of uh, tasks. Um, so in Postgres, Boolean is just one byte. Super efficient. Uh, and you can store three states in Boolean, right? There's, there's true, there's false, and there's null, which means I'm not. Um, integer is four bytes. Big integer is uh, 8 bytes. Timestamp of time zone is 8 bytes as well. Double precision is 8 bytes. GUID, which is very popular among developers for some reason, is 16 bytes. It's a huge waste of space. Um, and uh, text is 1 byte plus the number of bytes in your character string plus 4 more bytes if it's over 127 bytes. So let's look at using the right data type for your primary key and why that is important. Uh, let's create a table test that has uh, an ID column um, that I'm going to use for the primary key, which is big integer. And the content column uh, it doesn't really matter. So let's turn on timing, see how long it takes. So I insert uh, into test uh, 100 million rows. And that takes 1 minute 30. And then I create a primary key on the column ID. And that takes 38 seconds. Okay. So, uh, how big is this column? It's, it's 8 bytes. Select so column size from test. And how big is the index that I created for the primary key? I can see it's 2 gigabytes. Now, uh, instead of big int, Let's use UUID, which you really don't need to use as a primary key because the primary key guarantees uniqueness. So why do you need, why do you need a unique ID for something that is already guaranteed, right? So if you make uh, ID a UUID column and you insert into uh, the table, then simply generating the UUID takes three times as long, right? So now it's 6 minutes 27 for the same operation, which is an increase of 330%. Um, when we create the primary key on the ID column, it takes 78% longer to create the index. So, now my column is 16 bytes instead of 8. And my index has grown to 3 gigabytes, which is 40% bigger. So it does matter. It does make a difference. Um, so let's look at timestamp with time zone and why you should use always timestamps with time zone. The default of Postgres is uh, timestamp without time zone. So if you type timestamp, it means without time zone, which is called a naive timestamp. It means that it doesn't have any 
time zone information. Why is that bad? Because you cannot perform calculations between timestamps uh, if they're entered at different time zones. That's meaningless uh, if, if you're comparing local times. So you'll get the wrong results. And what if I use timestamp to always store UTC? Well, the database doesn't know it's UTC, only we know it. So it doesn't really mean anything again. Uh, use timestamp with time zone, which captures a specific moment in time and can be uh, added and subtracted correctly. So you can take a value in one time zone, a value in another time zone, and perform uh, arithmetic with those two values, and it will work correctly. And also, you can get it to display in your time zone. So the client always displays the time, the timestamp, in your own time zone. Except if you want it to display that moment in time in a different time zone, and then you specify just the past time zone. So, it's a good idea to also use timestamp with time zone as a primary key. Because it's a natural primary key for time series data. Do you actually need an artificial key if you have a timestamp and that is your main means of identifying different rows? Then do you actually need a different uh, artificial key? It's really compact, it's just eight bytes and stores all the information you need up to microseconds. It partitions very well. You can uh, create partitions and indexes that work perfectly fine because the, uh, the value underneath is just an integer. So it works very nice with the uh, tree indexes. But you can also create block range indexes, which are lossy indexes that are much, much smaller than the B tree index. So for 106 million records, uh, I created an, an index on a timestamp with time zone that was 2.2 gigabytes, but the Grim index was only 192 kilobytes. That is very small. So if you're not looking at the, to search for individual values, but you are looking to retrieve all the rows that are, let's say, uh, older than yesterday, then the Brin index can give you the answer. It has a small performance impact because it's a lossy index and needs to go back and recheck whether it's actually giving you the correct results. But look at the size difference. Another thing that gets misused is JSON. So relational JSON is uh, well, it's what I call it. Nobody else calls it that. It's an anti-pattern in which you use a JSON column as if it was a table in the database. So uh, I've seen code like this. I've seen this, uh, not the specific example, but code like this. So let's say select uh, the element ID from the JSON column, the JSON account that is stored in a table called accounts and join it with the table sales where you have another JSON column that stores the balance. And then uh, join and where the join condition is where account ID equals the other account ID. And I want to filter with uh, sale amount. So this is really hard to follow. Uh, this is a very complicated way to do a very simple thing in relational databases. Uh, so why use JSON in this way? So what it's basically trying to do, it's, it's trying to find a big sale over 10,000 for an account that has a balance less than 20,000. It's nearly unreadable. Um, and the point is that NoSQL or schemaless was meant to eliminate the need for joins because you have all the data inside the same document. So if you use it for this purpose, it's completely unsuitable. 
And it, needless to say, it performs very badly in postures. Let's spend a few moments talking about the right encoding. And um, there's an encoding, let's say, in Postgres that's called SQL ASCII. Unfortunately, it's the default. So if you call init DB to create a database and you don't pass any parameters, it creates it as SQL ASCII. And why is that a problem? Is that SQL ASCII is not actually a database encoding, it's actually the lack. So if you store your text in SQL ASCII, there is no encoding conversion and there is no validation for the data. And it just interprets uh, bytes from 0 to 127 as ASCII. And anything, any value that's over 127 is uninterpreted. It is whatever it is. It's a series of bytes. Um, so in that sense, it behaves differently from other character sets in Postgres. And if you use SQL ASCII to store strings, then you can end up storing different strings with different encodings, and then you have no way to retrieve those original strings again. Because you cannot tell which encoding they were entered in. Right? So don't use SQL ASCII ever. Instead, use UDF which is a very safe choice. It should be the default in Postgres. Most distributions um, and the package managers make sure that that is selected as the default when you install Postgres. So it is very safe. Uh, if you're migrating data from another database, like you have an old uh, uh, database from another vendor and you want to migrate to Postgres, you should really convert it to UTF-8 as part of the migration because that gives you the most flexibility. Uh, and Postgres does give you the conversion functions that um, can make that happen. You also should worry about your collations. What does that mean? Uh, sort order of strings in a specific language and the character classification because um, those can change from system to system. Yes. So this encoding is how the database internally saves strings. It, it's what it saves strings as. Yeah. It saves the, the, the bytes that you're going to give it for the character strings, but it's also how it interprets them. Oh good. Yeah. So UDF8 means that all strings are interpreted as UDF8. They're entered as UDF8 and read and interpreted as UDF8. Um, let's turn to performance and spend a little while talking about locking. Now, locks in Postgres, um, Postgres implements a concurrency control system that is called MVCC or multi version concurrency control. That is its solution for giving high performance when you have many sessions. Uh, running concurrently on the database. What MVCC guarantees is that reading, the database never has to wait for someone to write. So writing doesn't block reading, and reading doesn't block writing. So even if someone is reading from the database, it doesn't block you from writing to the database. Each write creates a new version of a tuple. So an update, let's say, is a deletion of the original tuple and an insert of a new one. And why is there a row called a tuple? It's because uh, Mike Stonebreaker was a university professor and he liked to call them tuples. So, the way that this uh, concurrency and safety is guaranteed and transaction safety is guaranteed is called snapshot isolation. Everyone connecting to the database has a snapshot of the database as it was when they began their transaction. And this is guaranteed with timestamps and transaction identifiers, or XIDs. Now, where we'll see where this comes in when we're discussing performance. 
may ask something. Sure. What if I keep my connection for too long, like two days? If I connect to the database, keep the connection open for two days, let's say. Some uh, it's manual application to use a. It's one of the following slides. Okay. So uh, let's look at logging objects in the database explicitly and why you should not do it. It's like taking the table level logs, like the shell log, or row level logs, like for update. So the way uh, logs work in Postgres is they create conflicts with other log modes. So access exclusive blocks everything else because it conflicts with row exclusive. So you can't have both. One of them has to be released for the other to happen. Uh, so explicit locks block read and write access totally, which leads to waits in the application, which is very bad for performance, and uh, you really shouldn't do it ever, unless your application is very well written. In most cases, it's not well written enough for you to do explicit locking. So please don't do it. Um, there's another type of lock in Postgres called lightweight lock. And a lightweight lock is also known as a latch in other database systems. It protects the data in shared memory because Postgres is a multi-process uh, architecture. So it creates a new process for every session, for every backend that begins. So all those communicate with shared memory. So Postgres is a multi-process system. Uh, lightweight locks make sure that reads and writes are consistent, and they have their own shared and exclusive modes, but they only last for a very short time. They only last as long as they need to uh, for this uh, safety uh, of concurrency to be enabled. So they enable and recency to be fast. They're only held for a very short period of time, and sometimes they're used internally in Postgres to protect I/O. So avoid locking objects explicitly. Um, if you can, if you want to serialize operations, you can use the serializable isolation level, which is known in SSI. And what that does is you make your application tolerant and you allow it to fail and restart because SSI is I'm trying to access this object. I cannot obtain a lock on the object, therefore I fail. So you make your application retry, that way your application doesn't have to wait. Instead of locking the object and waiting to get access to the object, it fails instantly and then you retry if you're accessing an object that you're not supposed to. So that gives you slightly reduced concurrency, but there's never any blocking. There's no parts of the application waiting for something else to happen. You don't need explicit locks. So for some types of applications, it's the best performance choice. So now we come to a really fun part, which is concurrency and how you control very high concurrency, and also how you control very high transaction rates. So by concurrency, we generally mean connections coming into the database. Uh, and really, uh, you shouldn't overload your database server for no reason. I have seen in production max connections 5,000, just because. But that has implications because it uh, means that you're creating overhead that is not necessary. And also it means that if you allow 5,000 connections, every client connection, as we said, in Postgres spawns a different backend process. So that means that these processes are running in the operating system, and the operating system has to make them communicate via Interprocess communication, semaphores, and shared memory. So the more you create, the more your operating system is overloaded because it has to do process accounting and take care of all of this for you. And with that comes the risk 
uh, which is you increase your complex switching in your CPU, so you make everything slower, basically. Um, and how many cores do you have on your server? Realistically speaking, um, I'm not saying you can only do one thing per core, but there's only a limited number of things a core can do. So if you have 60 cores, let's say, if you don't deal with 5,000 things happening at the same time. And also, another consequence of the lightweight loss that we talked about is if all of these 5,000 users, let's say, try to access the same objects from multiple connections, that will cause many lightweight logs to appear in the database. So they will further slow down whatever is happening because lots of people logging the same object will slow each other down. So how do you control concurrency? So before Postgres 13, uh, we had the issue of snapshot contention, which meant that because everyone connecting to the database needed a snapshot of the database because of MPCC, uh, that means even if you were doing nothing, even if your connection was idle, that still caused overhead. That has been somewhat fixed in later versions, but also you should be aware of excessive parallelization. And what is that? So, as we said, count how many cores you have to understand how many things you can do at the same time. So if you have like eight cores and you have a hundred connections for those eight cores on your server, and you also have max parallel workers set to eight, that means every core will now be asked to do eight times as much work if it's a parallel query that you're running. So you need to keep that into account. Count per cores before you set your max parallel of workers, uh, depending on the number of concurrent sessions you're expecting in the database. So you can monitor that by selecting from the view PG stat activity. And if you are seeing many lightweight blocks as the weight event type in that view, that means your system is probably overloaded. That means you shouldn't normally be seeing these things. So if you see lots of lightweight locks, it probably has something to do uh, with too many sessions trying to use the same objects. And a way to deal with this problem of too many connections uh, is connection pooling. So as a rule of thumb, you should never allow more than four connections per core coming into the database. So your connection pooler let's say, can accept 5,000 requests, but it should never open more than four connections per port to the database. Again, that's a rule of thumb, because every workload is different. Uh, so you can insert something like PG Bouncer between the application and the database. So the idea is you allow fewer connections into the database and make the rest wait for their time, but effectively, what you're doing is you're throttling the application, you're introducing the latency slightly on the application side, but you are saving your server performance. Because it now no longer has to deal with 5,000 connections, it only has to deal with as many connections as the application actually requires concurrently. So it sounds counterintuitive that you're making uh, things slower, but it's not necessary that things will actually slow down. Uh, your queries will actually execute faster if you do this, rather than opening thousands of connections and let them compete with each other. Now let's look at something different, which is having a very high transaction rate. So, uh, as we said, Postgres assigns an identifier to each transaction which is a long story, it's an unsigned 32-bit integer which gives you about 4.2 billion values and it's a circular space, so it gets recycled. Uh, which gives rise to the famous problem or infamous problem of transaction ID wraparound which is what happens when the transaction identifiers run out 
and you come to the same point. Uh, Postgres deals with that in a way that's called freezing. Uh, so, uh, an operation called uh, that old transaction identifiers are marked as frozen, so they are definitely in the past. Um, Anyway, it's a long discussion. If, if you're interested, to look up transaction identifiers. And if there's a question. Is it like by force, you mean Axon course, or do you count travel threads as well? Like how many you know on the call? Well, Postgres isn't multi threads It's only a multi-process, so it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, but you said that I, I should measure my, I, I shouldn't go over four connections to your core on my computer. You should, uh, it's different in different systems. So Intel systems, a core is a thread, right? But if you if you look at some architecture like a tower, you can get much more work done with a single core because it, it supports like 64 threads per core. Right? My uh, actually in the laptop has two cores, my old one, and it supports 400 threads. So should I count that for each thread? No, I think you should, you should. Again, it depends on the architecture. Yes. But generally speaking, for Intel, a core is a core. Uh, IBM power threads work differently. They work like a full core. So you count them differently. But this is, a, again, this is a rule of thumb uh, based on experience. So the problem with uh, transaction ID wraparound is when process doesn't have, uh, Postgres doesn't have the time to do this auto vacuum to freeze the rows. So uh, because very heavy workloads can go through 2.1 billion transactions quickly, I have seen a customer go through 2.1 billion transactions in a week. Right. Yes. Even then, it's not okay to just go over again on zero. Like, what happens? I mean, the zero will be like. Okay, I was trying to avoid this explanation, but what happens is when the wraparound happens, mm -hmm. when you go back again to zero, it's not actually at zero because it keeps moving. So it's 2.1 billion transactions in the future and 2.1 billion transactions in the past for you, mm -hmm. if you are transaction ID 10, let's say. Right, so the, the, the idea of Postgres concurrency is that transactions that happen in the future for you, future transaction IDs are not visible to your transaction, and those that are in the past are visible to your transaction. So if there's a wraparound and you start from zero again, for you, that's the future. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless it is marked as frozen. So if transaction ID zero is marked as frozen, then you know it's definitely in the past. So that's the problem of transaction ID wraparound. So if your system isn't quick enough to perform this vacuum and freeze, uh, you get a transaction ID wraparound. So that's why you should keep all the vacuum running. But the bigger question is, why do you need so many transactions? Why do you need to go through 2.1 billion transactions? Can you batch the updates to the database? Does your application really need atomic commits for everything? Or if you want to write uh, a thousand rows, do you commit a thousand times? Let's say you use a batch size of 1,000, right? So if you commit a thousand, things at the same time, then you have 1,000th the transaction rate. You have instantly saved your problem. You've instantly solved your problem of uh, too many transactions. So that is definitely something to consider. Now, um, tracking resource usage. Postgres has its own statistics system built in. Uh, it's called the Cumulative Statistics System, formerly known as the Statistics Collector. Uh, it's a sub-system that collects information about, internally about Postgres security. So it gives you dynamic statistics, which is what's happening right now. And it also gives you cumulative statistics, which is how many number of rows you've changed, let's say, uh, since the stats were reset. It also collects table and index information on how many rows and how many disk blocks. Um, and this information can be reported through views. One of the views I mentioned is PG stat activity, which is 
the dynamic information of what's running inside the server right now. So the concept is you can track those statistics over time to analyze your performance and make predictions about future performance. So you can use it for troubleshooting or you can use it for projections. Like I see that with the rate these numbers are growing over time, I'm going to have a problem in the future. You can log them with monitoring tools, um, but monitoring tools are more meant for alerting you to things that are happening right now. Um, you can export these statistics if you do something like Prometheus, or you can use an extension I've written which is called PG Statlist. <coughs> Uh, which lets you collect all of this data over time and store it as a time series inside the database itself. So you don't need to worry about Elastic and Grafana and uh, Logstash and all that. Um, now, distributed systems. And why? Yes, please. Sorry, just a quick win. Uh, is there a performance impact to statistics? Running internally? On some statistics which are disabled by default. Okay. You can't disable them in this one. Yes, but uh, most of the. This system already exists right, inside the Postgres. It doesn't have any performance impact. Some of them, like track function executions, need to be enabled manually. So if you want statistics on functions, let's say, that's an extra thing you need to enable. But generally speaking, no performance impact. So let's look at distributed systems and why you should not build your own. So something many people think they need is a multi-master system. So I have heard suggestions to implement multi-master using Postgres native logical replication or uh, PG Logical 2, which is an open source utility you can use for logical education. So, it's just as simple as establishing a logical replication connection in each direction, right? So, the problem is solved. And it's not as easy as that. Because there is the concept of replication origins, which is which node each transaction originated in. So, you can have a transaction, it can be replicated to the other node, and then the other node says, ah, transaction, let's send it to the other nodes, and sends it back, and we have a ping pong of the transaction going back and forth until you run out of disk space. Also, you need to worry about concurrency. Um, so what happens is both nodes decide to update the same node at the same time. What do you do then? Which means that there's a data conflict that you need to resolve. And conflicts are hard to resolve because communication, regardless of what people want, does not happen at light speed or even close to light speed. Right? So you have latency between the nodes. So if you have something, if you try to solve conflicts with synchronous replication, uh, or explicit locking, that has a very significant performance impact. So you need to worry about uh, data integrity and consistency if you have a distributed system. So are all nodes consistent? Uh, and a good example of a, conf a data conflict is when you try to update a row that the other node has already deleted. or uh, or if you need to update all rows of the table, but there's a row that you didn't know about. And so on and so on. So you have to think about all those things. So don't do it by yourself. Find a replication tool that already implements multi master and people have solved those problems for you. Don't do it by hand. You will miss something, definitely. Definitely. Um, and finally, sequence management. If you have binary keys that are generated by sequences, how do you keep them synchronized among all the nodes? Right? 
that is another quite problem to solve at hand. So uh, also with multi-master system, you can very easily cause serialization anomalies. Um, so your application needs to be multi-master aware in order to use a multi-master system. And you can cause a serialization anomaly if you read from one node, but then you write on another node within the same transaction. So, uh, and I mean application level transaction in this case. So then your application needs a global transaction manager in order to handle these distributed transactions. Because otherwise you can cause violations of atomicity. So even though something may succeed as an SQL operation, it may be an application level error. It may be a, a, an error in business logic. So it's like updating an account balance that has already changed on another node, right? Um, so you need to worry about these things. And can I ask something? Sure. Uh, I'm a device executed on the same node. Sorry? So then transactions would be executed on the same node? If your application knows about multi-master, then it knows how to do that. But if it doesn't, it thinks it's talking to a single database, and you have like a round robin and long balance in front of it, then it doesn't know. Uh, well, when I have a distributed system, uh, do I connect to one distributed system, or uh, every query I make, I go to the go to a different node? It depends on the implementation. Mm -hmm. So you either have to find a solution to always talk to the same node, or make your application uh, multi-master aware. Well, I like the first solution. <laughs> I keep seeing things. But then you don't get the advantage of having multiple servers. Uh, well, uh, yeah, but you know, I have uh, more resources in this way. At least that's what I get. So the bottom line is use the proper solution. If you want to implement a distributed system, build it inside your application first. Think about all the things that we talked about. You can use standard facilities like the serializing or isolation level that I mentioned to ensure that there are no anomalies. You can use things that have been there for decades, like two-phase commits, to solve the problem of consistency. And really spend a moment taking a step back and thinking, do I need multi-master really? And if you do, there are good use cases for multi-master, such as local rights in the geo-distributed system. When you want no latency for your local rights, but you want everyone to have access to the same database all over the globe. The user tool that was designed for this specifically. Uh, don't use replicators or CDC tools to implement multi-master because it, it will end in tears. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. um, configuring Postgres for production usage. And that is really important. Postgres comes out of the box with some defaults that are safe. They're very conservative defaults. And there are things like in PostgreSQL.com, it's like wall level replica, the safest uh, replication level you can have. F-Sync on, synchronous commit on, full page rights on. They're designed to protect you. And the safest choices you can make to protect your data. But some defaults are too safe. So, uh, while they are safe for running on any small system, like your Raspberry Pi, Postgres will work on your Raspberry Pi. But for production, these settings may not be enough. Right? So, like shared buffers is 128 megabytes by default. It's ridiculously small for the size of databases that we're seeing in 2023. Uh, Workman is 4 megabytes. If you sort a table that has more than 10,000 rows, let's say, it's very unlikely that 4 megabytes will be enough. 1 million bucks. So it will, it will need to spill over into this exactly. Um, the vacuum delay is uh, very low. So that means that auto vacuum, auto vacuum is not very effective. Which again is a problem. Um, it may be doing too little work to be suitable for production use. So, 
So another thing to be well is you shouldn't log to your data directory, which is what Postgres does out of the box. Because you run the risk of your logs growing so large that you run out of disk space. If it's on the same file system as your data. And the very easy way you can have that happen is an application error, like an endless loop, that keeps generating errors until you run out of disk space. Because the log keeps growing exponentially. Or linear, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you run out of disk space, Postgres will crash. So ideally, you should put your log files in a different file system so that your data directory does not run out of disk space. And of course, you should monitor your disk usage. Now, definitely uh, we need to talk about security best practices. And what I'm very happy about is that Postgres implements security by default. So there are no clear text passwords, impossible to use them out of the box. There is no access allowed by remote hosts, and SSL is used if it's available. And PGHDA conf is the host-based access uh, configuration. And you can see that by default it's quite safe. It only allows local connections. So either through a Unix socket or on local host only, or IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, it requires peer, which means the same operating system user as the username you're trying to log in, or you can have a password if you're connecting to the TCP IP. So as we said, it stands for host-based communication. You should never use trust there uh, to make your life easier and not worry about passwords because then you enable access to everyone else. So that is a very bad idea. Even for local use, if you're just connecting to local host, it means that a user that shouldn't be able to, if you have trust configured, they can connect to the database as well. And also, you have to consider the fact that Postgres might be fine because it's secure software. But other software on the same server could be compromised. And they may try to get access to Postgres. So the default should be giving access only to the users that actually need to access the database. So it's better to be safe from spreading. Again, on the theme of security by default, uh, we see that Postgres default configuration um, says that listen addresses are only local hosts. It's only listening. It's not listening on any network interfaces. It's only listening on local hosts by default. So nobody can connect from the outside. Password encryption is enabled by default. Uh, and that is a very secure way. Scrum uh, much more secure than previous default of MD5, which now is considered unsafe by the industry. And the SSL is enabled by default. So what does listen addresses equals local host mean? Uh, it's the network interfaces or IPs that you're listening on. Right? So there's a reason why only loopback is enabled out of the box. So make sure you only enable the interfaces that you actually need for your application to connect to the database and nothing else. Especially if you have like an internet connection on one network that is unsafe and you have the application in the private network uh, that is secure. It also means that you don't advertise your presence. Because if it's listening on an open network, you have things like in 2022 someone did a check and there were 3.6 million MySQL or MariaDB servers open on the internet, listening on open ports. So as we said, only give access to where it's needed. Use the database super user only for managing the global objects and nothing else. And by global objects, I mean things like users. 
because super user in Postgres bypasses a lot of checks and they can do anything in the database. So if you are running your application as database super user, then if you have code or bad code that is normally harmless, if you're a simple user, it can be used to create actual damage by a super user. So restrict also your database ownership to standard users. Don't make your uh, database owner be super user. What's new in Postgres 16 is that now the client can enforce the requirement. So it can say, the client can say, I request SSL. If I cannot get SSL, do not connect to the server because I don't trust it. And there's also Kerberos delegation. So if you're using Kerberos for authentication uh, and you have like a foreign data wrapper that connects to another database, then it delegates the Kerberos credentials to the next database. And you don't have to use different users connected. You don't have to use actually the Postgres user to connect to the other database. Finally, high availability and what the best practices are. The best practice for high availability is to make backups. PGDump is not a backup. A backup that is not tested is not a backup. A backup that is not automated is also not a backup. If you have to remember to run the backup, then it's already too late by the time you remember to do it. So use a special backup tool and one that supports Postgres specifically because it needs to understand how uh, the file system works and uh, the right ahead log and things like that. So use something like PGPackRest or Parman or, Net or any other open source and free tool that you can find on the internet. Uh, point in time recovery is something Postgres does which is a great tool which means that you can always roll back to a previous point in time. So if you have a backup, then you can use that to bring your database back to a previous state. So also when we're talking about high availability, we're talking about redundancy. Having extra servers around to use if one of the servers fails. So you can use uh, standbys with a high availability tool. So it doesn't, it's not enough to just replicate to a standby database, you need to have a tool in place uh, to uh, automatically make promotions of the standby databases into uh, primary nodes. So you can use things like Web Manager, Patroni, Defender, there are lots of tools for high availability in Postgres. If you're using Kubernetes, there's an official tool supported by the CNCF called Cloud Native PG which is written by Postgres developers. So it's the best way to get uh, your Postgres fix on Kubernetes. And that takes care of high availability in the Kubernetes way. It doesn't need any external tools to do it. So you need to really be careful about your architecture, how many data centers you have, how many witnesses you have, and whether they're enough for you to have uh, core Decisions. Yes. Yes. Uh, how does Postgres uh, do in case of uh, network partition? Is the partition So, uh, networks, network network part. Yes. Prefer to repeat the questions for the camera. Yes. So yeah. the question was, how does Postgres deal with network partitions? Right. So network partitions can lead to a split brain situation if you don't have one of these uh, high availability managers. These usually take care of the split brain problem, which is one side of the network thinks that the other side has failed, promotes itself to be primary, and then you have two primaries, right? So you have to roll back one of the two sides or reconcile every transaction manually to get back to one timeline. And that is what we call split brain. It can be avoided by having witnesses, and then the witness can observe and say, oh, okay, I see there's a network split here, because I cannot see the other node, and I can see this node, therefore, uh, this node should not promote themselves. 
to avoid the split break. So if you're in a part of the split, will you be able to read at that point, or do you have to wait for the portal? Uh, you can read on the standby side, and you can write on the, on the side where the problem is, but in order to perform any sort of failover, the network has to be restored. So you have to have a sufficient number of nodes in order to vote whether the uh, other nodes should become the binary or not. So you should always have an odd number of nodes per data center. Finally, uh, upgrading is important. Right? And I'd like to ask which version of Postgres you are using. So who's using 16? I'm using 15. 15? 14? I'm using the latest one, I'm not sure which one it is, but I'm running it only really, so... Okay. So this is usually where I get a hand up and someone says, I'm on 11. I keep asking 10, 12. Um, I see big, big difference in performance. I start with like 11, then I went to 15, then I see source run really compared to Sure, I mean, that makes sense. Um, yeah. That we get better performance from a newer version. And usually when someone says, I'm on Postgres 9.5, I tell them, I salute you, sir. <laughs> uh, basically, don't do that. Uh, why people avoid upgrading is usually it works fine now. Why upgrade? But what about tomorrow? How do you guarantee that your system will keep working tomorrow? Another thing is don't touch it. You might break it. But the opposite of don't touch it, you might break it is touch it, and you can make it better. So it really depends on how well you know the wrong system. Breaking is learning. If you try something and it breaks, then you know for the next time. Because if you don't touch it, and it just happens to be working, uh, you may get a false sense of stability, because it's never tested. Also, another thing that can uh, prevent people from upgrading is the upgrade procedure is not well defined. You haven't discussed it with your team, you haven't discussed it with your developers, your company doesn't have a uh, scheduled downtime, and so on. So, do operate regularly and get the benefits of open source software such as Postgres uh, because you get really quick updates, security updates specifically have, with Postgres have been known to roll out. In a number, in a matter of hours, since they're disclosed. Uh, when you upgrade, you may fix long-standing bugs that have not been detected for years. And we see fixes like that in the change log from time to time. And if you don't upgrade and there is a latent bug, then that may trigger unexpected behaviors in your software if you upgrade the rest of your software. So you need a QA system, a test system, that you can test the upgrades on. Um, and you should do that regularly. Also, test systems are free, right? Like, it's possible. You don't need to pay an extra license to keep an extra system around to test your upgrades. So if you don't upgrade, you may be missing out. People that stayed on Postgres 13 didn't get a throughput improvement for large number of connections, as we said before. They didn't get streaming of large transactions. They didn't get, they didn't get pipeline in the PQ. People that stayed on Postgres 14 didn't get improved sorts, as you mentioned, uh, wall compression. They didn't get the new SQL command merge that was implemented in Postgres. They didn't get improvements in logical replication. They didn't get JSON logging. People that now stay on Postgres 15 and don't upgrade to the new release, which is 16, uh, they won't get significant query performance improvements. They won't get logical replication from standbys. They will not get the new SQL JSON functionality. They don't get statistics for their I.O. Um, this is the view that tracks how many bytes get read and written from this. And they don't get regular expressions uh, that they can use to configure their PGHP account. Was there a question? Later, I'm, I'm applying the question. <laughs> okay. So, 
That's everything. Thank you very much. And this is really fun. This is a picture of the Isle of Sky in Scotland. Do we have time for questions? Uh, yeah. As you said before, it's a lot of fun and it's not like actually easy to point it out. But I guess the obvious answer is you just do benchmarks to determine how many mics you, you should keep open. Problem, problem is that in a client application, you can only really do ben benchmarks during production because how many connections is the optimal uh, configuration highly depends on what traffic actually does with your server. Right. So I wonder, is there any way using the statistics you mentioned to determine just how many connections you should keep open in my pool? Or do I have to rely on some uh, server-side uh, logging to As I said, if you track the internal statistics over time, and I've given you examples of tools you can use to do that, while your server is working, it doesn't have a performance impact, and you just see how many users actually connect how many of them were active at any time. Right? Yeah but I'm already using pooling to an extent but so there won't be more than n connections. Can I tell you if those n connections are too much or too low using those statistics? Right. So the thing you can do is set up uh, a staging system or a QA system, implement a similar workload on that system, measure it, and then you know what your production is going to do. Or extrapolate the numbers, right? So you don't have to, uh, you can scale down the workload if, if you don't have such a powerful machine. Ideally, your staging environment should be identical to your production environment. And then you can do performance testing on it. But there, there's no good way. So if you're only in production and you don't have a system that can run a similar workload, and because every workload is different, then you need to know exactly what impact your workload has on your own server. And the only way to track that is not only externally with things like latency uh, and things that are visible externally from the database, but also internal statistics. Uh, 